The film you're about to see has no characters, it has no people. It is a film to describe to you and explain visually the effect of cymatic frequencies on texture, structure, water, oil. If you spare a little of your imagination as you watch this film as it runs, you will see many things that answer many questions. You will see living forms, living amoeba, almost animal-like creatures. You will see continents being formed, the Earth itself coming into existence, explosions, eruptions, atomic explosions and bombs. You can see all this and watch it before your eyes. But any, everything owes its existence solely and completely to sound. Sound is the factor which holds it together. Sound is the basis of form and shape. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. We are told that this is how the world began and how creation took shape. If we put that into the modern idiom and say that into the great voids of space came a sound and matter took shape. Please watch carefully. We can also use different shapes of plate. Here we have a triangular plate with a crystal attached to its underside and produce a sonorous fit. We change to a higher note and see a rather more complicated figure. This more elaborate figure, likewise on a steel plate, is also produced by vibration. The exciting crystal is attached to the upper corner of the plate. We use sand and lycopodium. The lycopodium moves to the center of the fields and takes up circular shapes. The sand forms the lines. Each material has its own special way of behaving. Lycopodium alone, a sonorous figure, transition to a mobile flowing phase, and back again to the figure. The sonorous figures represent stationary waves but now we can also observe moving waves. Here, the sand is flowing in a current. When the wavelengths are short, these currents produce a rotary effect. Areas become defined in which the particles are actually rotating.
Now we produce two notes with frequencies which are so related as to cause a beat. The note seems to throb and, by using the method we have chosen, this phenomenon of beat or interference can be rendered visible. The figure sways to and fro, the figure pulsates. The picture has changed completely. Now we are exciting fluids. Under vibration, a layer of turpentine forms a regular lattice work. Vibrating glycerin, we see continuous waves which form the queerest figures. And yet, the extraordinary things we see here are simply and solely the effect of vibration. Here is a sonorous figure shown in a fluid. There are some wave fields where there was nothing before. Where there was previously sand, now there is nothing to be seen. The dynamic phase has become the static phase. Wave fields which make the vibratory process in the plate indirectly visible. Here again, interference can be demonstrated. All these wave fields pulsate. Interference becomes visible. A fluid, colored black, is dripped into a transparent fluid. Vibration now gives rise to curious eddy formations. It is always a pair of eddies that is created. One pair after another is generated so that we finish up with a whole series of such pairs of eddies in a symmetrical arrangement. The formation of these eddies by vibration 
is particularly significant because it is eddies of this kind which are specifically formed in the cochlea of our ears whenever we hear sounds. That is to say, they are not ordinary eddies as defined in rheology, but vibratory eddies, with the members of each pair turning in opposite directions. plastic substance. A plasticizable substance is always shaped into a ball by the wave trains of the vibrating membrane. The masses are jiggled round, but gradually proper spherical shapes are formed, created by nothing more than the vibratory process. The human voice can also be made visible with a simple apparatus. The various vowels show typical characteristics depending on the nature of their sound. We can see the spectrum, as it were, of the sounds. out as a sequence of vibratory patterns. We can see a melody. be made visible. The same membrane that emits the music can also make its vibratory processes visible through the medium of a fluid. Here we have the last 89 bars of the first movement of Mozart's Jupiter Symphony. We can see Mozart while we hear him.
Lycopodium powder, the spores of the club moss, reveals a number of quite remarkable phenomena when made to vibrate. Circular shapes appear, but these are in a state of continuous upheaval. The particles are pushed outwards from the center and inwards again from the outside. And at the same time, they pulsate. we can recognize the various patterns of the vibratory fields. They move to and fro, unite, and separate again according to the vibratory state of the surface formed by the membrane. And we can, as it were, move over a landscape which is in a state of vibration. If we intensify the note, if we produce a crescendo for the ear, the masses are hurled outwards. We see fountains, eruptions, explosions almost. But invariably, the particles return to the center, so that here again, even under these violently dynamic conditions, we find there is circulation. Here, a quick glance at a phenomenon with no vibration. Two liquids which spread by surface tension. No vibration is involved, but this phenomenon also progresses periodically, expressing the ubiquitous law of periodicity. Now we excite the surface on which the liquids are running. An entirely different picture is produced. It is even possible to make out a circular formation. Now there is vibration. But then the vibration slowly ceases and again we see a phenomenon without vibration. The regular pulsation of these spreading masses of fluid.
The behavior of iron filings when subjected simultaneously to a magnetic field and vision shows that adhesion to the surface is substantially reduced. The magnetic lines of the force round the poles show up with exceptional clarity. If we cluster the magnetic lines together, we can see the effect on the patterns formed. If we thin out the lines of force, the phenomenon spreads out. Because of the reduced adhesion, the particles of iron have certain degrees of freedom. They can move, fall into line, form figures, and almost dance, but only in obedience to the vibration imposed. Even these serpent-like formations are produced simply and solely by vibration over areas of the vibrating membrane representing movement processes. All materials and substances and the various states of aggregation behave in characteristic ways under the effect of vibration, or we can say that their behavior is specific. Here is a pulp. Here again, round shapes are formed, and the circulation is set in motion, but in the opposite direction to that observed with lycopodium. There is a definite ripple effect caused by the wave trains in the vibrating membrane, a rich field of effects due to vibration. They join together, separate, and pulsate. If we intensify the vibration, equivalent to a crescendo for the ear, the masses are thrown into ever greater agitation. They are ejected. Spikes are thrust up. There are eruptions. Protuberances appear. And all 
due to the dynamics of vibration. A whole landscape opens before us. The note we hear is strong enough to originate all this turbulence, this impressive display. contrast is a sonorous figure, a static figure instead of a dynamic one, representing the opposite pole in the vast range of phenomena that make up the world of vibration. Jonathan Goldman, founder and director of New England Sound Healers, a nonprofit organization dedicated to research and awareness of the use of sound and music for well-being. My guest is Dr. Peter Guy Manners. Peter Guy Manners is a doctor from England. He holds a number of different degrees, including Doctor of Medicine, Doctor of Osteopathy, as well as PhDs from both Oxford and Heidelberg University. He has researched and worked with Dr. Hans Jenny of Baal, Switzerland, Professor Gavo of the Sorbonne in Paris, France, Dr. Brunner of Heidelberg, Germany, and George Delaware at the Delaware Laboratories in Oxford, England. Since 1961, Dr. Manners has been applying his knowledge of the effects of sound for healing into the development of cymatics, which is now internationally known and used in various parts of the globe. His Brett Fortin Hall Clinic in Worcestershire, England, specializes in the use of cymatic therapy, the direct application of sound on the body for healing. Dr. Manners, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Johnson. It's very nice to be back here, too. Well, I wonder if you could tell us what exactly is cymatics? That is, is it a new form of therapy, or is it something that is very ancient, very old? What can you tell us about it? Well, basically, it is not something which is new. Um, it has been researched over a long period of time. Uh, a lot of research has gone into the work, and it has been in use for approximately 20 years in our clinic in Worcestershire. But over and above that, you ask, is it very old? Yes, mm. it is very old. Uh, the concept of sound or music or any of these type of things is as old practically as man himself. But in cymatic therapy, we have adapted it into the modern idiom, and, and now it is used in a technological way, which is scientifically approved, um, medically acceptable, and is in use in many clinics throughout the world. Is there some sort of history of the use of sound or music being used in ancient civilizations? I've heard that uh, stories of this type of... Oh, yes, experience. many of them. Um, we have worked... Uh, in the research field and in order to work in the research field you have to go backwards as well as forward mm -hmm. and we have traveled into many countries uh, examining the techniques anywhere where there's been any suggestion that uh, sound of any type was used uh, we found great evidence of that amongst the American Indians uh, where they used sound and vibration to heal the sick uh, in Greece in Egypt, in China, in Mexico, in Brazil, and practically all the countries 
uh, it has been used. Also in biblical times, of course, um, music and the formation of sound into a music form uh, was used with very great success, and you'll find great evidence of this in your Bible. Mm -hmm. The Bible, how so? There are many references to uh, calming the savage beast with music, and also we all remember the story of uh, uh, King Saul and the harpist that he always had to relieve his tension, his stress, and his strain. Uh, young David, I believe it was. Precisely. Yes, yes indeed. Uh, Pythagoras, who we know as the uh, father of geometry, was also involved in this uh, work. Is that true? Or, um... Yes, that's perfectly true. Um, but also the, the temples of Delphi, um, in, we have discovered uh, comparatively recently that music and sound was one of the concepts of their healing technique. Um, a lot of the stories which have been written concerning the temples of, of uh, uh, Delphi are not wholly correct. And uh, we found that uh, the pulsation of beating notes and music was one of the therapies which they used. Mm, fascinating, fascinating. Now, is cymatic therapy, what is it though? Is it, is it sound? Is it music? Is it, um, is it something you play from a tape recorder? Is it... Um... Well, of course, when you refer to sound, everyone sort of associates it with something that you listen to. Uh, with cymatics, this is not precisely so. It is literally the transplanting or the transmutation of accepted frequencies of sound into the tissue and structure of the human being. All the all, uh, uh, areas of the body, all the organs of the body, uh, produce a harmonic, a mm. sound. Uh, this sound is very small and very minute. Um, th this again is not a new concept, not a new theory, uh, but it is only in comparatively uh, recent years uh, that technology has caught up with the concepts and the ideas of this and we've been able to reproduce these frequencies and sounds. And now we can reproduce them, create them artificially, and transmit, transfer them back into the tissue and the structure. A lot of our doctors are referring it to transplant because technically I suppose this is what we are doing. We are transplanting the corrected frequencies back into the structure to replace any abnormalities that exist there. Mm. Also, of course, one of the strongest points which we advocate is that we can use this in place of drugs and medicine. And uh, if we can replace medicine with treatment, we find this is much better. It takes a little more time and you have to have a little more attention from your individual practitioner or your doctor. But then that is one of the things which we are trying to push forward at the present moment, that um, the medical profession treats every individual as a holistic being rather than a condition. Mm -hmm. so, so you're saying that there are different frequencies for different parts of the body and that with cymatic therapy you would somehow inject or put in the uh, correct frequency that is needed for, for that part of the body, is that correct? Uh, That's correct. Um, you see, every part of the body possesses a harmonic, whether it's the harmonic of the heart, the lungs, the liver, the kidney, muscles, bones, nerves, whatever it is, it produces a harmonic. This harmonic is now tabulated, we know what they are, and we can uh, reform these artificially on a computer. Mm -hmm. Then it can be played back into the structure and the system. It is pleasant, it is easy, uh, it is comfortable, there's no side effects. Uh, there are no, literally no conditions where it cannot be used, except if the patient is, has a heart pacer, but then that applies to all techniques of treatment if the patient has a heart uh, um, meet, uh, problem there. But other than that, there are no conditions that can't be treated. Even in pregnancy cases, we've treated them right up to the time of delivery. Mm-hmm. Now, Cymatics, what does the word mean? Well, in its early stages, which was now over 20 years ago, it was called sonic medicine or sonic therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, but the general public got this uh, confused with ultrasonics, which is quite understandable. Uh, so therefore, we changed the name to cymatics. Cymatics is a Greek word meaning pressure or waves. 
while we are using pressure waves mm -hmm. combined with the sound so it's perfectly technically correct. Also, it pays tribute to uh, one of the uh, doctors whose groundwork formulated this concept and this therapy, and this was Dr. Hans Jenny of Baal in Switzerland, yes. and he called his form of research cymatic, cymatic research. He did invaluable work, but what we have done is to bring the research of various physicists and doctors and scientists together, uh, the list that you've already quoted, uh, bring those together, and out of that we have evolved uh, a technique of treatment which is now internationally known and is used right throughout the world. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jenny's work has been published in a couple of books. Um, That's correct. There are two books which are beautifully illustrated and shows the formation of shapes and forms that can be uh, created by various frequencies of sound. Um, he lectured very, very little. He uh, objected to standing on a platform and lecturing, um, but he did make records of all his work. Uh, he made film of it. He took photographs of it. The books were illustrated from it. And just before he died, he passed all his research over to us uh, so that we could amalgamate it and fit it with other concepts of therapy. There's one doctor which we have left out in your list and um, he was very, very important, and that's Dr. Harold Saxon Burr. Uh, without uh, the concepts that he formulated, uh, we shouldn't be in the position we are today. It's only thanks to these people who have laid the foundations on which we can construct this therapy that we owe so very much to. Mm -hmm. Dr. Saxon Burr was associated with Yale University? He was at Yale University, And yes. his main um, work Involved. His main work was uh, being able to discover that you can measure the frequencies of radiation outside of the body. When he first postulated this theory, I mean, it was um, mistrusted. I mean, uh, at that day and time, I mean, very little was known about it, and uh, no one quite went along with what he was saying. Uh, but uh, fortunately, before he left this planet, uh, he was able to come back to Yale University, and I think the expression is his picture was turned away from facing the wall, <laughs> and there's now a picture on the wall again. Because he was a very famous and a very talented man, and the work that he did was absolutely invaluable in the fields of research. And we find that now we're moving more and more into this field of research, that more and more of the uh, technical truths which he uh, wrote up and experimented with are uh, of invaluable use to us. Mm. What are your basic principles of using sound or cymatic therapy as a uh, healing tool? In the first and early days of this, we kept it locked into the use of muscular diseases, bone diseases, joint deformities, rheumatism, arthritis, fibrositis. Now, we kept it into these various um, diseases uh, for several purposes. The main one was to accumulate as much information and knowledge and case histories as we possibly could to validate our concept and our theory. Um, but also, there was other things coming to uh, um, the concept, and that was it was very easy to treat because you treated the surface of the body. Um, but as it has gone along over the past 20 years, we have found now that we can treat all parts of the body and including the internal organs. And year by year, we are for having reports fed back to us from various doctors and clinics that are using the instrumentation that are feeding back new results and new points are coming to light. Perhaps you could enlighten us a bit more about how exactly you could use a sound or a tone to counteract a disease or something that is not balanced properly in the body. Well, if every organ and every part of the human anatomy gives off a signal, providing all those signals are in line with the general harmonic of the whole body, then you are in good health. But if for any reason, irrespective of what it is, if for any reason any of those frequencies fall out of alignment, then you are dis-ease or out of harmony, disharmonic. Um, 
also another thing which is uh, very important is that this simplifies to a large extent uh, the method of administering treatment or administering uh, medicine. You see a lot of these instruments are now being developed for third world countries. Now we can't hope to train uh, third world people directly into medicine over a short space of time. And if we don't do something quickly, I mean, many people are going to be in dire pain and straits uh, of which no help is done because, I mean, there are far too few medical practitioners to be able to deal with the amount of people that need help and treatment. Therefore, the effect of diagnosing a condition is not so vitally important. If you're dealing with it medically, a diagnosis is vitally important because otherwise you'd administer the wrong medication. But if you're dealing with some internal organ that is out of alignment and you're assessing it by its vibrational force field, then providing you can correct, or there's some method or some technique that can correct this vibrationary force field, irrespective of the condition which is causing it, you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. So therefore, many people can be helped merely by injecting the frequency back into the structure. And what also you've got to remember is that the frequency you're in injecting is the natural frequency. You're working hand in hand with nature. You're not doing anything contrary to nature because the adverse condition is contrary to nature. So therefore, if you're putting in the corrected frequency and signal, the human uh, structure is very keen to get back into mm -hmm. alignment. Mm -hmm. This is one of the uh, principal problems that have been in the organ transplant in surgery. It is the harmonic concept. Everything is taken into consideration when a transplant is done, whether it's by kidney transplant or heart transplant. Everything is taken into consideration. But up until a short while ago, we gave no consideration to the harmonic. And therefore, if the harmonic of that uh, transplanted heart is not in line with the harmonics of the rest of that system, we use the term, the body rejects the oh, transplant. Yes. This is merely what it means. Mm -hmm. It rejects it because the harmonic uh, evaluation of that heart will not fit in with the rest of the harmonics of the system in the body. Hmm. So in other words, um, in order to utilize a sound or a series of harmonics as a healing tool, what you would do is you would inject this into the body and that which was diseased or vibrating out of harmony or ease with the rest of the body would somehow resonate back to its proper frequency. Back to its is proper that, is that frequency. Right? But one thing we've got to be careful in this, uh, you use the word inject. Now, if we use the word inject, a lot of people think we're going to stick a needle into ah, them and inject something. We transmit it into the system. So the system is easy. There is no breaking of skin or surface. No needles are used. It is an application which is applied to the surface of the body. And if you apply sound in the audible range to the surface of the body, it will transmit itself right straight through the body and out the other side. Now, if there's nothing um, organically incorrect in the area through which that travels, it will travel straight through and be rejected on the far side. No harm will be done, no damage will be done. Mm -hmm. But if there's any abnormality in the frequency of the area that you're projecting the frequency field to, then it will rectify that as it passes through. And merely by simply placing the hand on the far side to which the applicator is applied, you can tell whether the condition is um, advanced or whether it's very bad or whether it's very slight mm -hmm. because if the frequency signal travels through very qu quickly there is very little wrong in that area mm -hmm. but if it takes some seconds or a minute before it travels through then you know it's meeting obstacles on its passage through the structure mm -hmm. What sort of cases have you worked with? Well we've dealt actually well I mean over that period of time with many thousands of cases uh, the early work in the early days was muscular uh, rheumatism, arthritis, uh, fibrositis, and the point was to treat these people. Now, in advanced cases, we particularly chose advanced cases in some cases uh, to see how long uh, or how much improvement we could get, where medically speaking, we said it was incurable and gone too far. Uh, in some of these cases, 
uh, the patients had had rheumatic disorders or arthritic disorders for a period of 30 years. Mm -hmm. They were elderly people. In many of these cases, we're, we were able to stabilize the condition and prevent further deterioration. But in lots of cases, we got improvement, and if we got cases early enough, then we got a cure. Mm -hmm. uh, but since then, many, many cases have been dealt with which have uh, no sort of relationship to the uh, cases we started off with. I mean, we've treated heart conditions, lung conditions, bronchial conditions, uh, intestinal troubles. Most of these conditions now can all be treated by this technique and mm. this method. And you um, have some slides that you're going to show us which may tell us a little bit about the effects of sound on some of the inorganic matter. Well, that is correct, because a lot of these slides are, uh, were originally done by Dr. Hans Jenny, showing the effect on substance and liquids and fluids of particular sound frequencies. Now, although they have no medical um, validity at this particular point in time, because we've moved on further to that, they are interesting in as much as you can see the effect. And I think it's always more convincing if you can see rather than just to hear what someone's talking about. So therefore, if you look at the film, uh, the slides, if you look at these slides, you will see how the intricate patterns which we can formulate in substance can be changed merely by altering the frequency fields. Mm -hmm. well, let's uh, take a look at some of these uh, now. We're going to show you now a few slides to give you some idea because I think if you get a visual interpretation of what we have been discussing you get a better impression of exactly what we're doing where we can go what we can create and what we can form it is scientifically correct to say that shape and form owe their shape and form solely to sound and by these slides we are able to show you how that shape and form can be held and repeated as many times as we wish, merely by the use of sound. Here we show one single drop of water placed on a plate to which the frequency field has been attached. By this means, we've been able to make it visual for you to see the geometric forms that can be formed when the cymatic frequency is filled into the structure. Here we have just one single drop of water vibrating at a low frequency. The low frequency gives the illusion that it is almost solid or semi-solid. It is not, it is just clear tap water and nothing more. Now if we change that frequency, we can change the form and the shape. This is again the same drop of water as in the previous picture, but the frequency field has changed. We have changed it and so long as that frequency exists, this shape and form will maintain its hold. It will act in this particular way every time this frequency is uh, placed into the plate, which is the dark area around the outside. If we change the frequency back, we can reverse it back to the previous one. But each time we change, so the frequency uh, modulates the single drop of water that's showing on the plate. Here again we have the same metal plate and the same drop of water. We haven't changed the water in any way, say exactly the same water, but again we have changed the frequency field. Within this we are using single frequencies and not the multiple frequencies of the uh, cymatic instrument. But as the frequency goes higher, you will notice that the design within it becomes a little more ethereal. In other words, we are seeing more spaces between. But even so, the spaces are still contained water. Again, same plate, same water. But again, the frequency has changed and we're becoming a little more ethereal again. It's gradually tightening up onto these areas and sparsing out in these areas, making the design a little more ethereal, looking less solid, in other words. Now, if the frequency field was changed back, we could recreate any one of these back in line, or move them up in line. We can recreate this time and time again, 
and make the same patterns over and over again. Now here we have a complete change both of the material that we're using and also the frequency field that's being fed in. This was our first realization that we could, apart from making a flat diagrammatic form on the plate, we could evolve it into a three-dimensional figure or form. What we are feeding into here is five frequencies into the plate which causes this malleable plastic to lift up to formulate into this form and shape and fold itself into the center groove along the top. It's in constant movement but keeping the constant form and shape. This was the first realization that as a cymatic concept and the cymatic principle could formulate a design and a pattern which was in similarity aligned to the formation structures within the human body. Now here we have a picture of cellular development showing exactly how the cell structure forms and how this interrelating form folds into this center crevice. It is a moving mass the whole time, moving in constantly, enfolding within itself. Here we have something which is just plastic, it's pliable plastic, but we're feeding a field into it which will create the same movement and basically the same form of the structure as the natural one that preceded it. Here again we have another picture of a cell development dividing into the four uh, concepts and the outer rim around the outside. Again in a constant state of enfoldment one side from the outer moving into the inner from all four sides in a constant state. If this was on a moving picture it would look like a living amoeba pulsing and moving. We have another picture which is very similar in appearance to the last one that we showed you but this one is again plastic being formulated into this shape and form by a cymatic frequency except that here we have if you notice there are five areas within it instead of four but the same action is taking place an enfolding movement from the outer rim to the inner points from the outer rim to the inner points in other words like a living evolving mass but it owes its life wholly and solely to the vibration or the frequency field that's being fed into it and nothing else. Here we have a very highly magnified picture of the uh, forefinger of a newborn child showing the sort of cell development that is in, uh, on, the, on the skin surface. This is lycopodium dust vibrating at a similar frequency formulating itself up into again these small center points almost a replica of the cell formation of the child's fingers. Now as you can see by the slides that you have seen we can reproduce the most fantastic shapes and forms. We can almost duplicate parts of the human anatomy and structure merely by putting the correct frequency into place and utilizing it. These things can be reproduced as many times as we want. Again and again, we can reproduce them and watch them almost like living shapes, living forms, living amoeba. But they owe their life wholly and solely to sound. And perhaps we do too. Well, that was very, very interesting, Peter. Some of those slides were quite astounding, especially the ones that we saw where the sound formation was almost exactly duplicate of the cellular formation. 
There's also a film that you have um, made with Dr. Hans Jenny uh, on this material, is it not uh, true? That's correct. I think if you see the actual film on it, it gives you um, a better concept and a better idea of how these shapes and forms can move. In some parts of the film, it looks almost as if it's a, a, a living, moving amoeba that's uh, existing there. Um, but all, all of it owes its life wholly, solely, and simply to sound. You mm. stop the sound and everything stops. You turn on the sound and everything becomes alive. It looks like living shape and form. Mm. Wasn't there something in the Bible? In the beginning was the word? I'm talking about the word maybe meaning sound or something like oh, that? Oh, yes, we love to use that one. In the beginning uh, was the word and the word was God. Well, I. I read this many times as a child and it didn't make much sense to me. I quite admit it was interesting, but it didn't have much sense. But what we didn't realize, and we didn't realize until comparatively uh, recently, is that within this we have a scientific formula. So if we turn it into the modern idiom, into the great voids of space, sound caused matter to take shape, because it's basically what it does. You can take any uh, matter what you like, whether it's a liquid, whether it's oil, whether it's dust, whether it's sand, whatever it is, and you can form it into the most intricate and fascinating designs and patterns and shapes and forms. But you see, uh, most of this work, the basic work, we have followed it up, it's true, was done by Dr. Hans Jenny. Um, but this, medically speaking, was not what we wanted. What we needed um, was uh, a harmonic that would form the not into a flat shape. You see, it's, it, most of these are flat shapes on the plate. We wanted something that would form into a three-dimensional form and shape, mm -hmm. something that would defy gravity, if you like, in which we had injected uh, levitation. Well, when I first went into the laboratory and asked my technician if he could formulate some way in which we could create levitation. He thought I'd gone start raving mad <laughs> and said, well, that's impossible. But anyhow, we, from single frequencies, we tried two frequencies, three frequencies, four frequencies, and the patterns become more intriguing. They became different. They become, um, if I may dare use this word, they become almost ethereal because they mm. become very fine and delicate. But it still wasn't what we were after. And we were almost at the point of giving up. when we said, well, we'll, let, we'll try one more. We'll try five. And when we tried five frequencies, oh, we nearly jumped up in the air because it actually happened. The uh, stuff that we had on the plate literally blew off the plate. So um, what we did then was to put a plastic, which we thought we could bind and hold together. And we put this plastic on the plate and sure enough, it formed itself up into a, a form defying the pull of gravity and started to form up into a holistic form and shape, mm -hmm. three-dimensional. This is what we needed. This is what we wanted mm -hmm. because this is the basic sort of formulative structure of shape and form in the human body. Mm -hmm. So we were really onto something. Mm -hmm. So in a way, then, the sound creates the form. The sound will create the form and will hold it for just as long as you want it to hold. But if you change that frequency, then it will, if you want to use a word, it will, you will have mutation. Mm -hmm. You will change the shape. So therefore, it is again correct to say, scientific fact, that as the sound, so the shape and the form. Mm -hmm. So there basically, we conclude from that, that the human body, in the form in which we see it, is held in that formulative pattern and structure wholly and solely by the sound it contains and makes. Mm -hmm. Peter, could you tell us a little bit about the use of cymatic therapy in hospitals and other clinical settings? Is it being used in hospitals today? Oh yes, most certainly. Uh, mostly into the um, uh, smaller consulting rooms. It's, it seems to be more an individual thing uh, rather than a collective thing in some of the large hospitals. But in the smaller establishments, in consulting rooms and clinics, it's proved absolutely invaluable. So many of the conditions, especially simple things like, uh, uh, as I say, simple to the practitioner but difficult to the person who's receiving it, and that is slipped disc, which can be horribly painful, 
can keep people away from their work or their offices or their employment for sometimes weeks on end, there's very little that can be done about it except tell them to rest and that's about it and give them a pain mm. killer. Well, now with the aid of cymatics, all this can change. We can alter all this. Uh, with the application of uh, cymatic therapy for approximately 10 to 15 minutes, the pain will ease down considerably. And invariably, when the tension is moved out of the surrounding area and tissue, very often, uh, without manipulation, it will slip back in place. But even if a manipulation has to take place, it can be done easily and simply. Therefore, the uh, older technique of osteopathic manipulation, which has been the, shall I say, the arguing point between the medical profession and the osteopaths, especially in the UK for so long, is now overcome. Uh, no longer do we have to, uh, what we term, a cold manipulation. In other words, force it back into position. Because once you've used cymatic on, the whole area relaxes, eases, and it will be comfortably back in position. Now, there are many other things that uh, we can ease and relieve pain uh, without the administering of drugs and painkillers. Uh, it has been found and checked by specialists in London who are using this instrument that the endophorins, which are the secretion from the brain, which ease off pain, it's like nature's uh, painkiller, is activated by the transmission of frequencies into the structure. We have used this in <coughs> hospitals where um, patients have been injured in mining disasters where the roof has crashed in. Now we all know medically there's very little we can do from this or except to clean it up, make them comfortable uh, and give them a painkiller if necessary and just hope that time will heal it. Well now we can do much more than that because for applying this frequency above the damaged area we can uh, deaden down to a large extent the pain and there is no side effects as if we have given drugs to mm. administer it. Have you uh, tried this in the situations of uh, cancer, for instance? Well, now, cancer is something which, the, uh, unless you are an MD, uh, you are not allowed to treat. Uh, we, we've got to remember that these instruments are in the hands of osteopaths, chiropractors, um, nurses, nurse consultants, all these kind of people who are efficient uh, practitioners within their own rights and they are using these instruments. Now with this instrument they are not breaking the law in any way, shape or form because we do not deal with cancer to obliterate it, we do not attempt to disintegrate the cancer, we treat the organ to which it is being troublesome. In other words if it's a lung cancer we treat the lung, we strengthen and fortify the lung and let the cancer take care of itself, and invariably this does happen. Dr. Manners, I know you brought your cymatic instrument uh, here from England. Do you think you can show us how it works? Yes, we can do that. That presents no problem now. In its early stages, of course, it was a vast instrument, which was very clumsy, very difficult, and couldn't be moved. Now it is transportable. Uh, it's no larger than a large attache case, and we can utilize it in homes, uh, or hospitals, clinics, nursing homes, consulting rooms. It can be carried by the practitioner or the doctor wherever you would like to use it. Ah, splendid, splendid. We have Priscilla King, a nurse consultant here who has uh, volunteered to act as a patient in the situation. Uh, I guess she'll take a little time off from her nursing as nursing patients to help and act as a patient. So why don't we bring Priscilla up here and she will uh, be happy to let you work on her with your cymatic instrument. Um, yes, we'd be most happy to do this, um, but at this point we must add that um, we shall only be able to use the applicator unit for this form of treatment. Uh, there is another form of treatment which is applied from the same instrument which has become known as biosomatics. Now biosomatics is using silent sound. There is no sound whatsoever. You are using the basic energy out of the sound, but in order to use this, you need the patient definitely in the clinic. 
because uh, saline solution and pads have to be used for its application. Um, if I might uh, explain how this functions, um, if a patient uh, has, um, or should I say, normal mobility in arms and legs, very often if they hear music or a beat in music, they will beat in time with it, either with a hand or with a foot. It's a very common occurrence. It's a very complicated thing if you run through all the procedures of it, but it's quite easy to do. But if there is paralysis or anything of that type within either the arm or the leg, the uh, uh, limb will not do it. Now, it won't do it because the left hemisphere of the brain is closed down on the synapse and it can't actually function it. But the, all the muscles may be correct, the nerves may be all right, joints, bones, everything is in order, but the synapse of the brain doesn't function the limb. Now, if we reverse the process of the cymatic input and put the input in through the hand and the arm, we can then re-establish a movement in that arm we can get the arm to beat in a normal, natural way. But that's not the end of the story. We can do that, and we've been able to do this for quite a number of years. Oh, it exercises the muscles, and it's very good, and it's quite interesting to the patient to be able to see a paralyzed arm moving and beating time. But that is not basically what we want. What we want is the synapse within the brain, the brain to start to activate this uh, movement. Now, previously, it was extremely difficult to, shall we say, go into another dimension of healing uh, with the ordinary medical profession. But of course, we're in more enlightened times now, and we can do this. So what we tell the patient is to close their eyes, to visualize on the paralyzed limb, see it in their mind or their mind's eye, and then as the impulse travels into the limb, to mentally lift at the same time. If they do this, then the synapse will start to function and we can get movement back into the tissue and the structure again. Sorry we won't be able to see that aspect of the uh, instrument being utilized, but I'm sure we will have an extraordinary experience watching this. The instrument is so designed to make it as simple for operation as we possibly can. On this side of the instrument is a sonic computer which will formulate the basic frequencies that you require for treatment. This can be then locked into the mind of it, transferred and recorded to a magnetic tape, and it is then ready when you plug in your applicator on this side to apply to the patient. And the way we apply it to the patient is merely to switch it on and turn up the amount of output on the applicator. The applicator is then applied to the patient. But before it is applied to the patient, it's always advisable, remember we're interested in holistic medicine and the patient is an individual, not a case. The patient is very often apprehensive, tense, perhaps tired and in pain. And we firmly believe that an application of your hand over the area first before any treatment is given has a soothing effect beneficial effect and the patient feels more confident. Then apply the frequency field. Now the frequency field that you're applying, immediately it is applied, the patient will relax automatically. As you're coming to the patient, they're a little apprehensive. Once it is applied, they're perfectly content, easy and relaxed. Because the frequency you're filling in, filling in is entirely in relation to the natural frequency there. You are using a natural frequency. There is nothing injurious, nothing harmful, nothing will do any harm at all. In this particular case, a nurse here hasn't any serious problems, but had she had serious problems and this joint was unmovable, a, a small application around the joint structure would ease down the tension and after a few manipulations by the applicator, you would be able to gently move the joint without pain or discomfort. Up in the area here, which is always an area of congestion, pain and discomfort, remember this is a very important area of the body because your eyes are controlled from here, 
the organ of balance is controlled from here, the facial muscles are controlled from here, and also the nerve going down the arm is all controlled from this area. It's a place where tension builds considerably. So therefore, by, by applying this over the area, you get a relaxed and comfortable feeling. Once the applicator is in contact with the patient, you have no further need to comfort or to reassure them. And it matters little whether it is a young baby, a small child, or whether it's an elderly patient, all of them relax, and it's easy, pleasant, and comfortable. The frequency field that you are actually hearing is the sound which exists within muscle structure. That sound that you can hear is the actual sound that is contained within the muscle structure amplified many, many thousands of times. And therefore, all that is necessary is to apply it over the area for ease, comfort, and relaxation. If they have come in and complained to you that there is pain in that shoulder and it's possibly rheumatism, they've not told you anything else, perhaps, and you are treating this they will very often say, Doctor, I can feel something happening down in my knee. Now the reason for this being that there's possibly a slight rheumatic condition in the knee joint, which they haven't necessarily told you about. But because the frequency field is traveling into the system, the whole system is consumed with it all the way around, and it will find any weakness anywhere in the body and deal with it as you're dealing with this area here. After you've done that for a little, if you are an osteopath or an orthopedic surgeon, then you can start to move. The area will move easily. It will relax. If you're going to move the arm joint, you'll find that you'll be able to move it easily and simply, and you will find the muscles will relax. How does that feel? Very good. As you put that on me, I felt my whole body start to just relax. You can feel it across all around the body. Yes. That's right, yes, because it's transmitting into the whole of the structure of the body. You see. Now that you have got the somatic instrument pretty well developed, you've had it for a number of years now and have been using it successfully, what are you doing now in terms of new frontiers of using sound? Oh, years? quite a lot, a considerable amount. Um, the instrument itself is fully developed, it's uh, scientifically acceptable, it's medically approved, and we now have these instruments literally all over the world in use, uh, particularly in the third world countries where we're able to train people efficiently and quickly uh, to use the instrument. But our research field at the present moment is um, stepping now into light therapy, which is becoming known as chromatology. Um, it was always previously thought that uh, the effect of colored lights, as they termed it, was a kind of gimmick, uh, in which you sat under a pretty light and it was very comfortable and it was very nice and very warm and very relaxing. Well, I'm afraid all that has now completely changed. We do know that light penetration can penetrate through the pores of the skin, it can affect the bloodstream, it can affect internal organs, it can do a considerable amount. We advocated uh, many years ago that uh, babies born with the bellorubin, which is yellow jaundice, uh, should be treated instead of blood transfusions and drugs, should be treated under blue radiation. Um, this was very suspect for a long, long time until one doctor in the United States tried it, used it, found it successful, and now this technique of uh, treating bellorubin is used all over the world now. So you're working with color, what else? We're working with color, but we're also working with the action of the brain. We find that if we use these frequency fields, we can affect the left and right hemisphere of the brain. Mm -hmm. And we feel that very often, a condition which causes paralysis or a problem in the human anatomy and structure has its seat in the left side of the brain. If we could only stimulate the right to sort of assist, take over, or form a bridge between the two, we could overcome a lot of problems. Well, now with 
uh, the advent of sound in a new dimension were able to do just this. And our research now is into using headphones which feed different frequencies into the structure in the system, also applied at the same time as light radiations and cymatic frequencies, were able to activate all the cell tissues and nerve ganglia within the body and we're getting very, very good results. And it won't be long before we are able to discuss this and uh, explain these details to you. Wonderful. I look forward to hearing about those at a further date. If people are interested in trying to find out more about cymatic therapy, Peter, how do they reach you? If they write to us, uh, Dr. Manners, uh, the Brett Fortin, B R E T. F-O-R-T-O-N, Brett Fortin Hall, H-A-L-L, -L, Clinic, Brett Fortin, Vale of Evesham, E-V-E-S-H-A-M, Vale of Evesham, Worcestershire, England. We will attempt to answer every letter, if I possibly can, personally. And this is also how they would get a cymatic instrument or information on the cymatic instrument, of course. We also train students at our clinic uh, so that we can qualify them in the use of cymatic therapy. And in the United States, those of you who would like to contact me regarding various uses of sound and music for well-being... Sha, the Sound Hills Association, may be reached by writing Post Office Box 2240 Boulder, Colorado, 80306. We continue to work with Dr. Manners, and we are very, very grateful for having had him here tonight. We hope that the information which we've disseminated has been of use. We thank you, Dr. Manners, so thank very, you, very much. Thank you, Jonathan. I thoroughly enjoyed being here. It's a pleasure here, too. Thank you. What we see here is the effect of vibration on a specific substance, lycopodium powder, or spores of the club moss. We have strewn it uniformly on a diaphragm of stretched paper with a diameter of about 30 centimeters, which we now excite by vibration. This causes the powder to clump. We can see many small clumps many small globular piles, and the more intense the vibration, the more piles there are. If the note is louder, that is to say, if the amplitude is increased, these masses of powder move to the center and make a kind of dust cloud there. An ever wider area of powder is affected, and more and more of these globules are formed. They are not at rest, but in a state of continuous motion. We can see a large circular shape forming in the middle and continuously moving. Sometimes it is whipped up into a cloud, as it is now, and sometimes it reverts to the solid dust particle form. 
These changes are caused by the differences in the intensity of the tone, that is, by the different amplitudes. In this experiment, the frequency, that is to say the number of vibrations per second, is the same. And now we see the circular form and everything in a definite pattern of movement. Now we shall take a closer look at these movements. Here is one of these forms. We can see how the material rises up in the middle and is transported to the periphery. This pile of dust, this heap of particles, is in a process of convection. The material travels inwards from the edge along the bottom of the pile, rises up in the middle and is then carried back to the periphery. Even if the intensity of the vibration changes, there is still a whole system of radial circulation. At certain frequencies, or with certain tones, an extraordinarily interesting phenomenon is seen. Watch. We see two regularly and continuously rotating areas at either end of a diameter, going round and round like weathercocks. This is the expression of a rotating wave motion. We can see they are rotating in an anti-clockwise direction. We now switch to a different frequency and produce the same phenomenon, but this time in a clockwise direction, because the frequency is different. If we go back to the previous frequency, we have the same phenomenon again in an anti-clockwise direction. Notice that this rotary movement does not affect the circulation or convection in the least. Now we can excite the same material with different tones all the way through the frequency band and watch what happens. Here we have lycopodium powder at a relatively soft sounding tone and we see that the pattern figures most prominently. We have motion two and circulation but above all it is the structural pattern that strikes the eye. And all the shapes lying about here, looking like monkey nuts, have these patterns of structure. Again and again there are convection cells, circulatory systems, forming there, making structural patterns in the lycopodium. Now, by changing the amplitude, that is, changing the volume of the tone, we can bring about a very interesting phenomenon. The tone is the same, but we introduce a burst, an amplitude burst, and every time we do so, it integrates the whole situation.
These dynamic events now lead to a phenomenon of exceptional interest. You must realize that the same diaphragm and the same powder are used, but that the tones are different. Here we have a flow pattern. This means that where we had a structural pattern before, we now have a violent dynamic one. A current is formed and the powder rushes along in the flow path, leaving the black patches of the diaphragm completely free of powder. Everything is driven into the flow path by the vibration. We add more and more material. But the result is not confusion or chaos. Instead, everything falls into place in the strict flow pattern. A point to notice about all these phenomena is that they can be reproduced at any time, that the factors and conditions of the experiment are known with accuracy. We go on throwing in powder, and every time this attractive and clearly defined flow pattern keeps on emerging from the vibrational field. It is a circulatory system without walls. The walls are, so to speak, the area of vibration. The area of vibration provides the constraint which gives shape to the circulatory flow. Different flow patterns are formed at different frequencies. This is a kind of double current, but at other frequencies we have, as it were, a four-part or quadrantal pattern. Here we have a formation with four fields. Here again we throw in powder and once more it is embodied in the exact quadrantal flow pattern created by the vibration. This is a particularly interesting phenomenon because it reveals not only the structuralizing effect of vibration but also its dynamic and kinetic effect. Here we have a cloud of lycopodium powder created by vibration and in it we can see extraordinary life and movement. We have eddy formations and sometimes even regular pairs of vortices. Then we have turbulences or unstable wave formations. And the interesting thing is that during all this welter of movement we have a structuralizing element on the diaphragm. At the very same time there is this zebra pattern on the diaphragm. Its one pole is structure and its other pole, dynamics. Even if we intensify the vibrations and make a very thick cloud, this pattern still takes shape on the diaphragm. 
as we slowly reduce the tone, which is a decrescendo to the ear, the pattern created comes into view. In the vibrational fields of this lycopodium and of other materials, we saw time and again that in certain places the material is thrown up, then all is quiet, then it is thrown up once more, then all is quiet again. We saw that it kept to certain places, that it did not splash about just anyhow, but that everything took place in particular spots. In this shot we can see how there is one place on the diaphragm in the middle of our picture where the material keeps on being thrown up. And observation has shown that what we have here is an interference phenomenon. The action of the waves is cumulative, their effects are summated at these spots, causing the mass to be ejected. Then quiet returns, then there is another summation. These events are reminiscent of processes in solar physics in which a tendency to repetitive eruptions, solar eruptions, has been observed. This repetitive tendency is particularly prominent in the chromosphere. Here, interferences are at work. Here, we can watch what these hemispheres are doing. There are many different things to see. Structure, for instance, which we have observed before, and which appears on these circular forms as patches. Convection, which we have also observed before, can be seen here too. But what is particularly interesting about these hemispheres is the curious way they move. They creep round. They do not disintegrate. They do not break up or crumble. And as they creep round, they take everything with them. When movement takes place in one direction, what happens is that all the material slips and glides along together. These small circular forms move like amoebae, but only like amoebae. They are not living systems. They move like amoebae, or, to borrow a term from biology, they move correlatively. These are movements of correlation. That is to say, the movement always takes place as a whole. Also, we see how these small formations unite, combine and separate. In this way, we realize there is always a whole. We always have something entire and complete before us. This is a particularly interesting phenomenon. We are able to discover it by using crystal oscillators. There are rotary processes, circular movements, which proceed with absolute regularity. Centrifugal force is not a factor here. The whole pattern is elicited by continuous parallel waves. Here we can see the currents running in contrary directions and creating a rotary effect or revolution. Here there is something very interesting to watch. Once again we have interference. That is to say there are two tones. One moment the waves summate, then 
they cancel each other out. They summate again, and every time they summate, we have dynamics. And when they cancel each other out, we have rest and structural pattern. We see structure alternating continually with dynamics. Structure and dynamics. What we see then is not caused by switching the vibration on and off, but is itself a vibrational phenomenon. Structures appear, clouds are formed, there is movement and change, forms emerge, all as the result of interference. Whole squads of forms appear, unite again, separate again, but always there is wholeness. It is as if these vibrational fields were providing models for a holistic theory. Here again we have continuous waves. These are very large diaphragms, rubber diaphragms, more than a square meter in size. Whole squads stream along in one direction, others in another direction. Structural patterns appear, structural patterns unite. We are looking into a whole landscape of lycopodium created by vibration. Once again, we have material rotating under the influence of continuous waves. And we can see how, in certain places, there is an inward flowing current, and in other places, there is also an inward flowing current from the other direction. So we have, as it were, rivers of material flowing in from diametrically opposite directions and they are then revealed in these regions of rotation. The points of inflow are diametrically opposed in these rotating areas. Here we can see very clearly how the material flows in at bottom left and top right at diametrically opposite points and in this way is incorporated into the rotary process. Here again there are currents, parallel continuous waves moving in opposite directions which carry powder along with them. This last experiment is really extraordinarily interesting. We are looking into a funnel. We apply vibration and the material is brought out of the bottom of the funnel. It is transported upwards against the force of gravity. But it is not simply thrown out. It moves round the periphery of the diaphragm, round its circumference, and then goes down into the funnel again. If we intensify the tone, 
then the upward march of the material is preponderant. If we make the tone soft, the material slides down again because the static friction on the undersurface of the diaphragm is reduced. The adhesion is reduced and, consequently, the powder slides down again when the vibration is less intense. Sometimes then, we have a process in which the material moves out and sometimes a process in which it slips back. When it slips back, it covers the whole cone. When it slips out, it climbs up the wall of the cone. So, on the one hand, we have an anti-gravitation effect and, on the other, a sliding effect resulting from reduced adhesion. When the vibration is of a particular character, we have a process in which the material is transported out and, at the same time, slips back, so that there is a convection current on a grand scale. This is a detail from part of the edge. It is a complex phenomenon, but, all in all, its organization is unitary. Anti-gravitation, a downward slide due to reduced adhesion, and convection of the whole mass of powder. Here, we see a heated and therefore liquid blob of kaolin excited by vibration. In this experiment, we can follow how the phase of the material changes as it cools. First of all, we have wave fields. We can watch the liquid substance rippling. Gradually, it cools and the liquid phase changes to the plastic. And from the plastic phase, it proceeds to the solid phase. And we can therefore speak of solidification under the influence of vibration. Here, the plastic state has been reached. There are no longer waves, but a clumped mass which is rotating and circulating in itself. The substance gets harder and harder and more and more solid until, when it has cooled, the kaolin is completely rigid. All these forms, all these structures which we see here, have been created purely and simply because the substance has solidified under the influence of vibration. We see branched and ramifying patterns. These are not crystallized forms, but sculptural shapes resulting from vibration. We can call them dendritic structures, finally passing over into filigree. What is involved then is a change of phase under the influence of vibration, solidification, that is, as an effect of vibration. <laughs>